This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. Uh, with me, as always, on Wednesdays is Chad Oban, who uh, is my co-host these day, on, on Wednesdays. And then uh, also joining us is Jason Bohr from the North Dakota Lignite Energy Council. And the reason why I wanted Jason on the show is he was recently uh, featured in a Washington Post article. And the headline of this article was, was kind of surprising, Where Electric Cars Could Help Save Coal. And it's interesting, it, this, the Lignite Energy Council has actually been doing this for, for a while. And it, they, what, what they did is they went out and they bought a Tesla, uh, and they put all sorts of pro-coal propaganda on the side of it. I say that. <laughs> uh, but they did. Uh, and then they've been driving this car around, and I think it's confusing the hell out of everybody. Um, and I wanted Jason to come on and, and talk about that. and Because the article is kind of talking about how you know they went out to western North Dakota, and they met with all these people who... You know, sort of have this this cultural aversion to electric cars, and I, I should say up front, I think electric cars are cool. The gadget nerd in me really kind of wants to have a Tesla. Like, who doesn't want a car? I, I want to hook my car to my Wi-Fi and do all sorts of weird stuff. Like, I kind of want that. Like, I think that's cool. I don't think they're very practical for a lot of North Dakotans right now, just on a you know, right. on that basis. But I think they could one day. I think they're going to be. I'm excited for them. So I don't understand a lot of the cultural hostility, but it's out there, I guess. But, but why? I mean, I guess the question for you to start out, Jason, uh, and Chad can certainly join in here with questions as well, is why is, your, why is the coal industry promoting electric cars? Uh, there's a couple rationales behind that. And it started out kind of from the premise that you just said, which is I don't understand some of the cultural hostility. Right. So so we saw that. And I'm sure all of us, myself included at some point, have partaken of that cultural hostility where, you know, there's a certain stereotype of certainly back, whether it was uh, South Park Simpsons, you know, this Prius stereotype. And it, it comes from this place of maybe not understanding why somebody would uh, really, really want to jump into a uh, fuel economy or maybe even just saying a little bit of antagonism of, I don't uh, agree with your values that, that, you know, you're buying a different vehicle than I am. It's become part of the culture um, war. I mean, I think that's what you're trying. It's, it's part of the culture war. Yeah, it, it, it is. And so, so when you guys were talking about the state of politics, um, what we're trying to avoid is diving any more deeply or getting tied up more deeply into that culture war because what coal does not need is to be more tightly embedded in that culture war. What we need are people on the right and people on the left who say coal needs to be part of the solution. And whether it is coal uh, and nuclear on the right who are shedding advocates on the left or renewables who are um, encountering hostility from the right, that isn't productive to what this country needs because what I said in the article is true wealth is created by a partnership between you know humans and the earth and that is as true if you are putting a new coal plant in the ground as if you are putting a wind turbine facility on the ground and it filters down to the way we drive our, our vehicles um and the other part of this is that there is no right way to drive a car or no right way to have a car you know you think ford versus chevy is crazy a uh, way to you know electric versus gasoline there is this is just a choice and what we were seeing is electric vehicles were leading down a path that didn't make any sense for the coal industry because these things run on our product and have people driving up to the coal mines making fun of electric cars when uh, if you put two electric cars into your garage all of a sudden you're consuming more of the product that we are creating and it's actually a pretty significant amount so let's 
at least get away from the culture war part of that by answering questions. Everywhere we drive that thing, people are, you know, asking questions. I had one person, you know, say, why are you driving your competition's car? And he said, what do you think my competition is? <laughs> and once so, I asked that question, then they kind of like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, if the if the oil industry starts driving around uh, a Tesla, then maybe maybe that question's valid. I think Chad's maybe got a, a little question. bit more valid. Yeah, that would be, yeah, Chad's got a question. Yeah, I, I think that sort of is an interesting perspective on you know coal and oil are seen as just fossil fuels, right? They're one in the right. same. I don't think we should be confused by why the coal industry would want electrical vehicles. I mean, why we shouldn't be surprised that any industry wants to expand. Um, what they're trying to do, you know, people using their product. But is your embracing of electrical vehicles causing any issues with the, the petroleum world, the, the oil world in North Dakota? Um, you know, obviously they want to use their product as well. Yeah, I, I think probably at some level it is. <clears throat> but at the levels, you know, where we work, I think what they see is a pretty big picture, which is uh, gasoline vehicles are going to be around for a very long time. In, they're better for many things than electric cars, and there are more opportunities for oil to diversify than there are um, for electric vehicles to take over. So there is some of that. Um, we are very cautious and cognizant about our messaging because there there are some people who like electric cars and make fun of, you know, uh, you know, traditional internal combustion vehicles. We never do that because there's not a wrong choice out there. If you want to buy a car that's best for you, we trust the public to do it. And so, but yeah, it, it's something that we're aware of, we're cognizant of, we try and um, educate uh, and, and, you know, make sure that we are not trying to build up the electric vehicle industry by tearing down uh, a pillar of North Dakota's economy. I, I, I think, too, that that gets into a misconception about a lot of these debates is, is this idea that there's going to be one. Ro I mean, the, the, the internal combustion engine has, has sort of dominates transportation, right? Diesel, gasoline. It's what we use. Um, it may be the future is not going to be some dominant replacement to that. You know, maybe the future is going to be a lot of different ways. I mean, maybe it makes sense in the future for long haul truckers to run on gas and for in in city uh, delivery trucks like UPS or FedEx to run on electricity and for me to own a gasoline car. I mean, every one of those applications is potentially going to have something. And to me, I'm all for lots of choices, like buy the car that works for you. If it's an electric car, hey, that's great. Um, but, I, but I feel like we're doing that all over. We're not just doing it in with vehicles, but we're also doing it on the electrical grid where we're, we're thinking we've got to replace everything with this other thing and this is what's politically favored and this is what not. It's like everything is coming through the culture war, which is why I think it's really great that the Lignite Energy Council's driving around an electric car because it's, it's just saying, let's just go with what works. There's a lot of people for which electric cars are going to make a lot of sense. And I think as, as the technology improves, I think that number is going to increase. And let's just let's just live with that reality. That's the reality of the world. Yeah, it's funny that what you do learn that you didn't think you'd learn when we went into this was how emotionally invested people are in something that is inconsequential to their life, which is the technology their automobile uses, right? That's kind of weird to say that I'm going to judge you, Rob Port, based on how you get to work, not the quality of your heart. <laughs> you know, it's weird, right, to say, I don't like that person that just drove by me, not because they cut me off, that's justified, but because their car runs on gas or because their car has a battery, that's pretty weird. Jason, I think that, you know, it's really interesting thinking about the politics of coal. As somebody who's left of center, I get frustrated with how partisan coal is. I mean, here, here's where I'm coming from. I'm not a policy energy expert. Here's what I want. I want to flip my switch. I want the electricity to turn on. I want it to be affordable for my mom who's on a fixed income. I want the planet to be clean and sustainable for my son as he grows grows older, right? I mean, those are some pretty simple wants and I think we probably all want that. But the, the sort of conversation around coal in this country, it's like the left wants to get rid of everything, 
the right says there's there's nothing happening with the climate, so we don't have to change everything, or at least that's the perception. And here's the deal. I'm left of center. I appreciate the really, really great jobs that are produced in coal country, many of them union jobs, which I also appreciate. But I don't know how the coal industry survives if you're at the whim of every presidential election when it just swings so back and forth. How do you how do you pull out of that? How how do I get Democrats to listen to the fact that those jobs are really important to our friends and neighbors, and that's what we're supposed to care about? Yeah, I I think the there's an outline in that article that that can get you there. I I do wish the article would have done a, I mean it was an EV article, right? The coal industry is still very vibrant and it's still very focused on its environmental sustainability. I think that message gets lost in the, you know, for lack of a better term, the culture war. But how we get people there is the shared values because we share the values of how can we improve our environmental footprint and sustainability. And one of the ways we're doing that is by is through carbon capture. I think the more work we do on carbon capture in partnership with both Republican and Democrat uh, administrations gets you to a point where you can say, this is another answer. And to, to help people step back from the brink of antagonistic politics, say, well, wait a minute, what would it take for you to, you know, what is your objective here? And most of the time, an average person that you ran into at the grocery store, you ask them, what do you want out of life? Their answers are going to be pretty similar to you. They want a clean environment and they want some recognition of, hey, if I believe the climate is changing, what is the response? And we're in a position to be able to say, we've invested more money in carbon capture than, you know, it would take to build, you know, a, you know, a, how who knows how much renewable power or whatnot. But we've done these things because we share the values that you just described. Even, um, you know, you overlap a lot when you start talking about objectives and not um, methods. And that's one of the things we try and harp on. Well, I, I think it's really, um, you mentioned carbon capture. And, and again, I, I think what we're talking about this with this Washington Post article you were in, and by the way, people want to find it. The headline is where electric cars could help save coal. Um, if you want to go out and, and Google that article and find it, it was published by the Washington Post. Um, a lot of the reaction where we talked about sort of the culture war reaction to electric cars. And then Chad brought up, you know, there's, there's always this sort of political reaction where it's like, like, well, if I think of myself as left of center of a liberal, then my attitude about coal has to be this. Or if I'm right of center, my attitude about solar panels has to be this. And I, I mean, we're, we're seeing that I, I think, I think play out in carbon capture because my inbox gets filled up with, you know, environmental groups who are just dogging, the carbon capture thing. And, and listen, I'm all for skepticism. We're spending tax dollars on it. It should be scrutinized. I'm all for fair critiques. But there's this antagonism where it'll never work. They're just throwing money away. And it's like, you know, when, when that antagonism is focused on, you know, spending tax dollars on research and development for battery technology, which is central to the electric <laughs> car question, you know, everybody's fine with that. Nobody's, you know, you know, or, or at least the people who are upset, a lot of the people, I should say, who are upset about carbon capture are not upset about that. You know, but in some ways, I mean, Tesla's still, I mean, a lot of Tesla's profits are still coming from state mandates that force other car manufacturers to pay Tesla to manufacture cars, right? That is an enormous subsidy. It often gets overlooked in Tesla's success. And I think it should give people pause. I don't think that's unfair to point out. But there's this hostility. So we've seen that a lot with the carbon capture thing where, where there's just this antagonism to it. And I'm thinking, listen, if we could figure out a way to continue using these enormous coal reserves that we have, but use it in a way that's in line with modern thinking about the climate, why wouldn't we try to do that? It's a resource that's there. If we walk away from it, we're just leaving that resource under the ground. That makes no sense to me. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because um, if you talk about battery technology and whether it's for utility sales uh, storage or whether it's for electric vehicles, because that's that's a problem with electric vehicles is how heavy their batteries are, how quickly they degrade in cold weather. Now, if you bring that up to a, a strict partisan, 
they'll say, well, we have scientists working on that and, and we're very close to solutions. But if you bring up carbon capture to that same partisan, they react as if it's pie in the sky. Even though we're both putting our trust in scientific progress and what the last 200 years has demonstrated is that's a very safe bet, not just for carbon capture, but also for scientific technology. Um, you know, every time, and I, I don't interact on Twitter nearly as much as I used to, but every time I'd get those comments. You're not, you're not missing quote, anything. Well, yeah, right. There's a great quote from President Obama or Canada Obama who says, I believe in the ingenuity of, of you know, the American people to get there on carbon capture. Like, yeah, right. That is, a, a, it used to be a more common attitude among a lot of Democrat politicians. Um, Maybe a little less common now, but it's still, you know, common enough. But you got to get away from that weird uh, dichotomy where you can trust the scientists on battery technology to get to the goal, but not on carbon capture. Yeah, but I, I think one of the reasons why you're seeing something like carbon capture sort of be more pal- less palatable now to Democrats than it used to be is because of the people that are getting elected. Right. I mean, there was a time when Kent Conrad, Byron Dorgan and Earl Pomeroy were all championing carbon capture in this part of the country. Montana had Democrats as well. But as you're getting even more polarized in Congress, you have less of those voices. Heidi Heitkamp's not there championing the coal industry within that caucus anymore. And I think that leads to even more partisanship. You know, Uh, Joe Manchin's there, you know, championing coal. I'm I'm trying to think, are there are there any other in I'm trying to think in the congressional other than Joe Manchin, is there. It, it kind of seems like the Democratic Coal Caucus is a party of one these days. So, yeah, I mean, there, there are some voices, and I remember that Senator Heitkamp had a good relationship with Senator Whitehouse um, on carbon capture. So there's some other voices out there. Um, and it's one of the issues is coal mining and coal production um, just doesn't have that broad economic base that some other unifying things do. Right. And what I, I'll tell you something that I also see from time to time um, is that sometimes coal and the war on coal is a very good campaign issue in states that don't have a really big coal industry. And so you'll have down ticket Republicans who are trying to get elected harping on the war on coal but they don't really care about it, right? And and we have that. You could probably see those scattered throughout the United States. But uh, having coal as a political issue and not a practical problem to solve is a problem because there are practical ways to solve it that get subsumed when environmentalists can talk about how they're going to let people who put the coal industry under and how you know, maybe on the right, you've got people who w- would ignore the existence of people like Joe Manchin or Sheldon Whitehouse who are talking about solutions. Yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely fair because that's again, I, I think I think going back to something Chad said, I think we just want things that work. Right. I mean, I, I think reasonable people just I power plants. I, I remember when we had the, the you know, some of the blackout issues not that long ago. Um, you know, I, I talked and it, it got me thinking like a lot of this stuff, sewage plants, power plants, nobody thinks about this stuff. The average citizen doesn't think about this stuff until the toilet doesn't flush or the light doesn't come on. Now, all of a sudden, you know, it becomes an issue. And so, but most of the time this, this stuff is sort of relegated to these, you know, obscure government committees at the state and federal level that not a lot of people are paying attention to. It's not on cable news at night. I mean, unless somebody's being dragged before one of these committees so that the politicians can scream at them, it doesn't make it doesn't make news. And that's unfortunate given how central, you know, it is it is to our lives. When when XL is coming out and saying your electric bill is going to go up, you know, however many dollars because of things that are going on. I mean, you look at the public reaction to that. People care. It impacts them. It matters to them. But it's it's like they, we kind of tune in at the wrong moments and, and a lot of times for the for the wrong reasons. We got just about a minute left with you, Jason, so I'll let you sum up. Yeah. So I, I, I really think that if we are focusing on objectives for coal, this is one of the objectives that provides us a path forward um, that gets everybody's objectives met. It 
has the potential to give other people you know opportunities and options in the marketplace gives the coal industry one more market to fill and at the you know at the end of the day what we're trying to do is maintain that partnership of sustainability between man and the environment that creates wealth and prosperity in this country and this is just one more way to do it building on that track record uh, i think we got the research and development track record to prove that we're going to continue to make it happen chad any final thoughts before we let jason go no, I think these are really important conversations for us to have because I think one of the things that's often lost on my side of the aisle are those people working in coal country. And we think that, oh, you know, when national politicians just say, well, we'll train them on green energy jobs. If I'm my age and I'm working in a plant, the last thing in the world I want to do is get trained for a completely different job. So I think I think about this in terms of people. I mean, I want to turn on the electricity, but I also want to make sure people have good jobs. And, and the coal industry has been good to workers. Yeah. All right, Jason, we'll let you go. Thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you. Jason. We'll see you guys. Take care. Well, I, I thought that was a really good conversation with Jason Bohr, um, who's a knowledgeable guy. And, and again, I, I think we got to stop looking at this stuff through the culture war, through the partisan lens, and start looking at it through, hey, I'm a person who gosh, would really like my lights to come on in the morning and get a bill that I can afford to pay uh, and have all that stuff be reliable. Um, you know, so I, I think that's an important conversation. Anyway, enough of that. Yeah, but, but, but Rob, one last thing, and make sure that the plan is sustainable for the long run, right? I think that we have to have the conversation that includes both sides of that. And I sure. think the coal industry needs to do a better job of sort of talking about that and talk about what they're doing with carbon capture uh, to be part of the solution. I, and I, th I think they're doing better, but then also on the left, you know, maybe stop some of the antagonism. Like not every investment in carbon capture is just a sop to the coal industry. We're trying to use this stuff better. And as a conservative, like I don't have any problem with the government spending money on research and development. I think that's a, that's a role. We've done it for years. We've always had partnerships with our academic institutes and everything else. That's fine. I think that's an appropriate role. I don't want to subsidize production, right? That's where I get a problem. Where we're gonna, we're just gonna pay a company to produce its product. That's where I have a problem. But are we, if, if we're gonna help subsidize scientists so that we can find new and better ways of doing things, I'm all for that. Um, right. I, you know, and and I'm for that as well. And and like I said with Jason, I think focusing on the people who are working in these plants and, and what that means, um, and having real conversations, and not just saying we're gonna put a bunch of miners out of work, right? I mean, yeah. that, that doesn't help uh, our conversation or help Democrats in this part of the country. Frankly. No, it doesn't. Um, all right, let's move on. Let's talk about state politics. We had a special session last week, but this week, you know, I, I think what kind of dominated headlines and discussions in political circles was obviously tax commissioner Ryan Rauschenberger um, hitting another bump on what has been a very, very long road to sobriety. Um, I, I'll tell you, Jim, when that, when that heart, when that news broke, I mean, as just on a person, my heart broke. Um, I think Ryan is good at his job. I think he's one of the nicest people I've ever met. He's a, he's a super great person. And it was, it's heartbreaking to see a, a person struggle like that. Right. No, I could not agree more. I mean, and, uh, has, as somebody who quit drinking years ago because of, um, you know, not struggles to that level. I mean, I can really relate to that. I had a, you know, a father who died in a car accident where he was drinking as a state legislator. And, and every time I saw one of those articles about Ryan, I thought about my dad, right? I thought about, is this how this ends? Um, so I was happy to see him resign, not from a partisan point of view, not because I think he's terrible at his job, but what's happening right now in his life is not sustainable for him and i think making that decision is really really important and um it was it was not going to end well if it just stayed on the same course i was i was very happy that in the past the voters gave him another chance because i am very much an advocate of let's let's leave behind some of these puritanical attitudes about addiction and recognize the fact that that these are human beings, even even elected leaders, even celebrities, they're human beings. And we don't necessarily need to punt like they don't stop being all the good things that they are because they struggle with addiction. So I was very happy when he had struggles in the past that North Dakota voters turned it around and, and gave him another shot. That that was very gratifying to me. I thought that was um the ex an expression of perhaps a more enlightened attitude that, about addiction than we've had in the past. But I, 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 th I think I agree with you. You know, this is strike three. You know, there's a point at which 
obviously the status quo is not working. It's not helping him find sobriety. And I think he needs to get out of the public limelight and go find whatever's going to help him find sobriety. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I obviously from a partisan perspective would have liked to see Ryan lose his last couple of elections. I don't think he should have lost because of, you know, these personal sure. um, issues that he's dealing with. Um, but again, I think having real conversations about addiction, I think it's something that the governor's office and the first lady are doing very, very well. Uh, but then taking it seriously. Right. I mean, I, you know, so I was the executive director in 2014 when he had a, of the Democratic Party when he got his first DUI. I, I broke. I broke. Well, he didn't get a DUI in 2014. He had lent his car to a friend okay. who was was involved in a, in a wreck. And I I can't I'm pretty sure that person was charged with, okay. with DUI. I, I don't remember. But but what happened was is I because I broke the story. I, I had somebody tip me off and say, you know, that was the tax commissioner's vehicle that was involved. Um, I called Ryan when I talked, when I spoke to him on the phone, um, that day, I mean, he still sounded inebriated to me. I ended up talking to him again the next morning. I ended up breaking the story. Um, and that was kind of the, the beginning of that. Um, and it was in my position, it was a terrible position because I had Democrats calling me and saying, basically, you need to go after this guy. You need to attack this guy. You need to whatever. And again, with, with a family, uh, who's had issues with alcohol in the past in a, in a pretty public way when, when my dad was in the legislature. I didn't think that was a good political strategy, and I just didn't think it was right as a human being. But, I mean, I literally had people calling and saying, um, you're not up for the job if you're not willing to take this guy on on this. And it was, I mean, these issues, I, and even yesterday, you know, when Ryan resigned, these aren't partisan issues. I mean, I think if you're trying to score political points on somebody's personal downfall, it never ends well because we all have relationships with people who have had issues with addiction or been arrested for things related to um, alcohol and other things. So I, I think it, from a partisan perspective, people have to be really, really careful with this. I mean, this yeah. is a this is about a human being who, again, I don't know anybody who doesn't personally like Ryan. Right? He's a really nice guy. Um, so I, it's a, it's a sad story and I just hope he gets it figured out. I, I do too. And I, I mean, just, just to be clear, I mean, I've, I've had my own story. I got a DUI. I, what was it? Five, six years ago now, you know, I'm not, not proud of it. Terrible thing. I, right. I, I paid the price. Uh, and it's, it's a terrible thing, you know? So I, I think, like you said, everybody, if they haven't struggled with it personally, they definitely know somebody who has, and, and you can't ignore the fact that at, at a certain point, uh, as, you, you can't ignore the impact that his struggles may have on his job performance. Um, you know, if that's, I think that I've always thought that's fair ground. If you want to, if you can show that he's not coming to work or he's missing meetings or he's not on the job because he's having troubles with, with drinking, that's impounds. That's completely fair. And, and one of the problems is in two of these incidences in 2014 and now this most recent one, you have him on a weekday. Right. And, right. and I, I think in 2014, it was like a Tuesday afternoon. He'd been day drinking on, you know, this time around, he was trying to check into a hotel on a Monday and maybe he's taking leave time. He's an elected official. I guess I'm not real sure how that works for statewide elected officials. If they have, they, they, they don't have to take time. Yeah. They, they so are I, at their own discretion so, to come and go as they please. So that, but that cuts both ways. Right. I'm, th I, right. I'm thinking there's probably a lot of people in the tax department um, this week who are saying, you know, I was at work on Monday. I was at my desk. I was ready to go. Uh, why can't Rob, our boss? Rob, that's yeah, that's a, think, that's a fair I, criticism. I think you're absolutely right. And I think they're, in fact, I know there's people in the tax department that over the last several years have been like, where's this guy been? Um, yeah. He's not in the office. Um, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. So I, I agree. That's fair criticism. Um, and uh, <laughs> I mean, it was 1.30 on Monday, right? I mean, yeah, on a, on a school day, if you will. Um, you know, I think that's really, really concerning to me that that feels more concerning uh, than an issue at midnight on a Saturday night. Right. I mean, it just feels differently from me. I mean, I'm, I'm from a from a from a public servant perspective. Yes. I think and from an addiction. Well, perspective. Right. I right. mean. I think there's a difference between day drinking on a Monday morning and, and having some beers. On and maybe getting carried away at a barbecue or something on a Saturday. Um, right. Neither is good, 
uh, you know, I don't think we're trying to make excuses, but uh, one, I mean, yeah, one is, is speaks to, gosh, there's a very, because it's, I mean, a, a social drinker can make a mistake, right? Like you had a few too many, you made a bad decision to drive home, you get a DUI. That's not good. There's no excuse for that. You shouldn't have driven. I shouldn't have driven, but that's a different matter than I'm drunk in the middle of the day on a Tuesday. Ugh. Yeah, and and I don't know why the the resignation is effective January third. There's got to be some reasons for that, but I wish he would have done it immediately. I, I mean, I I just wish that the the tax taxpayers didn't have to pay his salary for the next six weeks uh, leading my, up to his resignation. Yeah, my understanding is he picked that day. Um, you know, the person who's in control of that is is Ryan. You know, it's it's. I think sometimes when something like this happens, people have the mistaken belief that like the governor can fire. That's not how right. it works. The tax commissioner is elected of the people. Um, either he resigns or you organize a recall, which you're not going to do between now and January third. So the date's up to him. I don't know what the thinking is behind that. I don't know. I think he's a guy that carries cares for his job. Maybe he. Uh, you know, has some things he wants to finish out. I, I don't know. I don't know why January 3rd. But um, now begins the process of of picking a a new tax commissioner, and I wrote about that a little bit. Um, some of the names that immediately were thrown around to me in texts and calls and everything else were uh, the lieutenant governor, Brent Sanford, which is a, a logical choice. He's got a um, he's got a CPA. Um, you know, which, which probably commends him to that position. He, um, and everybody keeps telling me that he doesn't get along with the governor. There's some tension between him and the governor and he's looking for an off ramp. Now, when I talk to him, he denies this completely. That's the persistent rumor out there for what that's worth. Um, I, I talked to him though. He said he doesn't want this position. Um, doesn't want to be tax commissioner. Uh, the other one I heard a lot is Michael Howe. He's a state representative from West Fargo. Uh, he ran Congressman Kelly Armstrong's first campaign for Congress. Um, people were saying, you know, you know, he might be in line to, to maybe want this position. Um, but when I spoke to him, he said, no, he actually says he has his sights set on Secretary of State, which is another position incumbent. Al Jagger's not running for reelection. So he's he's thinking he wants to take a shot at that. Um, the one person I did talk to who said she she would be interested is Senator uh, Jessica Bell. Uh, formerly uh, Senator Jessica Unruh, her, her new married name is Jessica Bell. Um, and when she called, she she said, you know, acknowledging, you know, she she heartbroken that it's, you know, the, the for why the opportunity was was created, but said, you know, if the governor would consider her, she'd want the job. So that's one name that's that's out there. Or wh what are you hearing, Chad, in terms of? Um, so yeah, making the assumption that the governor's not going to appoint a Democrat or somebody who is technically yeah, I don't, skilled in, in tax. I don't think. Uh, I, I, I think it's good because whoever gets appointed is going to have to turn around and campaign for this right away. Yeah. Uh, so absolutely. I think it's going to be obvious. Obviously, the Republican governor is going to choose a Republican candidate right. as a yes. Democrat <laughs> governor would pick a Democratic candidate. And and probably it's going to be somebody who's political, not somebody who like Joe Morissette, who used to be the deputy at the tax commission, the tax department, who's now at OMB, a lot of people were thinking, and and I don't know. I mean, it could be. I, I think he's qualified for the job, but I'm not sure. I think it's hard to come out, and, and now all of a sudden you got to raise money, you got to run a campaign, and all that stuff. A lot of people, they don't want to do yeah. that part of the job. So Rob, obviously, I was sort of joking that yeah. he's going to appoint a Democrat, <laughs> um, but you know, the one name that I heard right out of the shoot was Senator Bell. Um, you know pretty much everybody i think your article sort of confirmed the direction that this is going um you know i you know i think about what the senate looks like if senator bell is now the tax commissioner and you know these pretty dramatic heck uh representative powell uh running for secretary of state and if he wins and he's no longer in the legislature you know i, I don't know him at all but what i know of him is he's a workhorse right he's not some flashy stand up on the floor and make a, a bunch of crazy speeches, um, but really is in there working on appropriations. So Jessica Bell is the one that I've heard the most. I think she's qualified because of her position uh, working as the, the chair of the finance, finance and tax. And tax yep. I, I will tell you, I have always find, found her uh, very easy to work with, uh, agree on some things, uh, disagree on more. Um, but I, I think she'd be a good tax commissioner and a, and a good appointment. And I also know, I mean, she's friends with Ryan. So I'm sure this is a really tough, tough thing for her to be um, dealing with. And, 
you know, the idea of getting into one of these roles and this is the way you do it probably isn't how she how she imagined it no. would happen. But and and, I and I, I, having spoken to her, too, I know for a fact it's not this is not the way she wanted to advance her career, but things are the way we have to deal with the world as it is and not as we uh, would like it to be. So so that's where we're at. For the Democrats, you know, I obviously I think anytime you don't have an incumbent, the the conventional wisdom is that's an opportunity, right? Where somebody's coming in and they're a fresh face, they don't have the advantage of incumbency. Um, you know, Democrats were already going to have the Secretary of State as a as a potential. Um, we're still hearing, waiting to hear what what Attorney General Wayne Stengem is going to do. I, I emailed him actually this week, and he said he's still going to make up his mind when I spoke to him in January he said by Thanksgiving so we're, we're coming pretty close so we'll yeah. have a we'll have an announcement from him pretty soon um you know and now and now this position whoever does get appointed you know is not is technically going to be the incumbent but not really um you know so I was kind of thinking you know those are sort of the opportunities that maybe Democrats are looking at the statewide ballot but I mean I, I gotta think if, if Secretary of State and maybe Attorney General's on the table in terms of recruiting people, I got to take tax commissioners down the list a little bit. Yeah, what, what I know in, in talking to people over the years on the Democrat side of things, there's a lot more people interested in being secretary of state, like actually doing the job than there is at, at being the tax commissioner. Uh, I don't know why that is exactly. Maybe it's just of interest more than them. And attorney general, I mean, it depends on who runs, right? I mean, if if Wayne doesn't run and Drew Wrigley jumps into the race, I, I think that's that's an uphill battle for any Democrats. I also think it's hard, these down-ballot races where you, you, you can't find any oxygen to sort of define yourself unless you raise a ton of money as a Democrat. You're more likely to see part of, like, you know, you and I have talked a lot about if, if uh, some person goes in the ballot box and they know nothing about the Republican and nothing about the Democrat, they're going to vote for the Republican if they're, you know, lean right sort of people. It's hard to break through down ballot. And I and I, I think also because a lot of those in North Dakota, we like electing everybody, There's including so people who maybe we shouldn't be electing. Like, the, the, what does the tax commissioner really do in terms of making policy? Um, now, sometimes these down ballot offices sit on, on some pretty important boards you know, the treasurer, for instance, is on the state investment board, but that's hard to build a campaign around. Um, right. So I, I think when you're, you know, Democrats come in and, and they're at a disadvantage um, because of, of the, the partisan inclinations of North Dakota. And then you're also running for an office where it's really hard to build a platform because, you know, basically these are administrators and not really people who are are can, can can craft a policy platform. You understand? Yeah, you know, you know, and I remember uh, races the the Brent Edison Corey Fong race back in whatever year that was. It was all about lowering property taxes. The tax commissioner really can't do much to lower property taxes. But right. That's what that whole race was about: bully pulpit to lower property taxes. And so you almost have to find issues like that if. If somebody's not running their office completely incompetently, right? Um, it's really hard to find the policy arguments. Like if they're show if they're showing up to work and they're showing yeah. up to the meetings. Well, it, yeah, because the incumbent can simply say it's not my job to make policy. Right. This is my job, and I'm doing this job well. Which also makes it why are we electing you? Like right? why why wouldn't we just let the governor appoint a person when they come into office? Like, I don't think we should. I like John Gottfried. I think he's a smart guy. I think he's got a bright political career in front of him. But I don't understand why we're electing the insurance commissioner. Yeah, but that allows me to say that I vote for one Republican. <laughs> I like John so much. It makes me it makes me more bipartisan. Yeah. Yeah. You're uh, you, you endorsing a Republican is about like me endorsing a, a Democrat um, yeah, for. I, Rob, I don't do it publicly. It's just like. <laughs> I mean, yeah. can we edit this part out so it doesn't kill John's? No, no, you said it. You said it. Now it's part of the public record. I will tell you the reason why I like John Gottfried so much is he and I worked together on a campaign, the uh, the property tax elimination campaign. I ran that campaign and my office was in the state chamber office, like my campaign office. So I went to yeah. work every day with John Gottfried. And I used to tell him that. I have to go home and hose myself off before going into the house uh, to, to sort of get. That oh, off. the chamber of commerce isn't that bad <laughs> for crying no, out loud. I, it was mostly just, but yeah, I mean, and, and that's, a, so that's a, an example of, you know, back in the day, how, uh, I mean, literally progressive 
pro-union guy, Chad Oban, walking into their office every day for about six months to run a campaign. Uh, the good old days when people could get along. Yeah, well, I, I think those days are still here. Um, obviously, we're doing this podcast, so that's something. Uh, <laughs> special session, how do, you, how do you think they did? Uh, I, I wish they would have focused on redistricting and spending a billion dollars. Um, I don't. Well, they spent problem. that billion dollars. Yeah, they <laughs> did. I wish they would have just done that. Uh, but uh, you know, the tax stuff that came through, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, the fact that it's tax credit, sort of one-time funding rather than lo lowering rates. I'm glad they didn't lower rates, other than the Social Security thing. I hate the fact that there was so much time spent on um, on CRT and vaccinations and all that kind of stuff. I think that. You can't have real conversations about real things um, in a week's time. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it was another example of um, us not being able to have serious conversations about policy. And then, of course, Nicole uh, announcing that she's not running, um, I think, was really jarring to that chamber. I mean, you saw the emotional outpouring from both sides of the aisle. Yeah. Um, she got a standing ovation. Uh, Senator Ray Holmberg. Um, had a very had, had an emotional after she she stood up and announced had I don't know if he knew I, I'm sure he knew it was coming ahead of time but um, had a had a very emotional reaction to it right on the floor I mean very tearful saying you know thanking her for her time and and, and saying goodbye so um, I, there's a lot of things we just unpacked there so let's let's talk about the critical race theory stuff first and setting aside how we might feel about critical race theory and and I'm Maybe I'm a bit of a fence sitter on this because on one hand, I, I, I think it's kind of I think I think a lot of it's just reactionary. I think it's just cable news. We just came through a very slow time in national politics. Cable news needed something to latch on to. So this is kind of a reactionary Fox News thing to a point. That being said, culturally, I mean, I don't I. I I don't, I don't want, I mean, I'm looking at some of the stuff like the 1619 Project. I don't want that stuff preached as gospel in our schools. And I've spoken to educators who also don't want that kind of thing preached as gospel in our schools. So insofar as there's a debate to be had, you know, I agree with that. But even setting all of that aside, you're talking about a special session that's already going to be very busy. And you're going to hurry up some some legislation through that session that's going to have some very dramatic implications for curriculum without giving people a lot of time to show up. Now, I, there was a group of, of a coalition of lobbying groups or interest groups or whatever you want to call them who came out and, and, and sort of were pleading to the lawmakers, please focus on redistricting, focus on the Biden bucks and let the rest of this stuff go for a regular session. And I, I agreed with that because the problem with the special session, because everybody was like, oh, but we the people, we the people want this stuff, right? Well, the problem is, is most people know when the regular session is and can organize their lobbying efforts, can organize their trips to Bismarck. But for a special session, it's like all of a sudden this thing comes through the delayed bills committee and now they got to rush down to Bismarck and try to testify in, in one of these things. It's, it's not a diligent, it's not a very transparent process because it's such a compressed, I, I, when I say not transparent, I think they were doing their best to be transparent. I think it was as open as they could make it, but it's a very compressed amount of time. And so you're acting, asking people to react to these very consequential bills on a hugely compressed timeline. We shouldn't make policy that way. That's a terrible way to make policy. Yeah, and I think the CRT thing is, um, you know, how you feel about CRT, how I feel about CRT is sort of irrelevant to this conversation, right? right. It's not being taught in our schools right now. But what we, what's going to, I worry is going to come out of this is the effort of the legislature to pass something to make sure that parents who are upset about this potential issue know that we're serious, we're not going to be teaching here, is going to lead to more problems. Because, okay, now there's been a bill that says we can't teach CRT. The problem is everybody defines it differently. I mean, legislators were getting emails about we got to get rid of CRT because teachers have pride flags in their classrooms. That has nothing to do with CRT, right? And so now are we just going to lead to a situation where parents are coming into buildings and saying, you know, you can't teach this, you can't teach this, you can't teach this, because they define CRT 
is being so wide. I worry that we're creating even more problems for people in the buildings. And I and I will I'm going to connect this to Nicole Pullman uh, really quickly. You know, one of her last votes was on this bill, and from my perspective, she voted wrong. And she told and and she said one of the reasons was that she wanted to send a message to parents that this isn't being taught here. And I talked to her after the session was done. I went up, my son and I went up to see uh, Aaron at the session, and I went up to talk to Nicole, and I we were, we were chatting about you know her re retirement and all that. And then I brought up CRT, and I said, this is why I think you were wrong on this, or you voted wrong. And she said, oh, I completely understand where you're coming from. And I said, I understand where you're coming from, and we just disagree. And then she wished me a good weekend Yeah, to have a good weekend. What a crazy concept, Rob, right. that I could go in and talk to an elected official and say, I disagree with you, and here's why. Well, because some of the people know. who showed up to testify on that CRT bill, I mean, they, they came in, they were very, very hostile and aggressive and uh, towards the, the committee members were not, I mean, it was not, in a lot of ways, not a civil conversation. And uh, here, here's one of the problems. I mean, I because I, I have I have... The bill, House Bill 1508, it was introduced by Representative Jim Casper. I have it in front of me. I actually wrote about it this week as part of a larger column, sort of asking, can somebody tell me what conservatives stand for today? And and this was, you know, I, to me, conservatives stand for free speech or should stand for free speech. So let's 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 read an excerpt from the bill. This is the key part of, of Representative Casper's bill. It says, I quote, a school district or public school may not include instruction relating to critical race theory in any portion of the district's required curriculum or any other curriculum offered by the district or school. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, one of my favorite classes, maybe this isn't surprising given what I do for a living now, one of my favorite classes at school was civics. And one of the reasons why I love that class, I think we called it American government, but whatever, I thought of it as a civics class. Um, and one of the, the best things is that the teacher, we would discuss uh, things that were happening in the headlines at the time. So, can a, can a high school civics class have a classroom discussion about the debate over critical race theory? I, under this language, I don't think that they can. I think that that's yeah. now illegal. I'm not sure that it's legal to talk about the critical race theory bill in schools. And, and to me, that's nuts. I think this bill probably, if they had more time, probably could have been amended to avoid that outcome. But it wasn't because it was rammed through because a bunch of people who watch Tucker Carlson every night wanted this uh, wanted this to happen. You know, I, I I read your column about what conservatives stand for, and and I couldn't agree more. I mean, when you think about this special session, that the state is now telling local governments what they can and cannot teach. The state is now telling businesses what they can and cannot do in terms of keeping their employees and, and patrons safe. The state is telling um, pharmacists what they have to be able to um, prescribe, right? I mean, that bill changed a little bit. But what is conservative about any of those things? But between the state telling local government what they can and cannot do, telling businesses what they can and cannot do, it's, um, it's ideologically confusing um, to me on, on how to even – and that's it's one of the things I thought a lot about last week. How do you influence this legis as somebody who does lobbying in the organization I work for lobbies? It's really hard to lobby these days. And I'm sure nobody's feeling sympathy for lobbyists. But when the facts are different, like we're not working from the same set of facts. Um, you know, I, I joke that the Ibram, one of the ivermectin bills, one, the legislator who brought it forward, it's like they just read the whole Internet. Like everything that they saw on the internet, um, they 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 said, you know, is is gospel. Um, anyway, that's a long way of saying I'm confused by conservatives in the state currently and what they actually stand for because uh, As am like I. everything that's a priority um, goes against the small government ideology that they. they well, I'm I, I'm out here getting accused. I mean, every day. I mean, I, it's like I'm Chairman Mao now, according to some of these people. I, I'm. A communist i'm a democrat i'm a biden supporter and everything else which i am not um it continues i find communism and socialism to be one of the most offensive ideologies humankind has ever come up with so i'm not those things at all but i'm also like looking at the conservative movement going well it's like that line from office space where it's like what what, what would you say we're doing here guys what are <laughs> what are we doing 
Um, are we limiting government? Are we because it kind of seems like we're just growing government, but we're just growing it in ways that are in line with our notions about culture. I mean, to me, the conservative position is the government's a neutral actor, right? Like the government provides the roads. And then, you know, we're generally we're going to have a few rules on how you can use those roads. But beyond that, we provided the roads. Go drive on them. Right. Like that. To me, that's the conservative position. The government's going to do some things. But for the most part, we're going to keep it out of our way. Go live your life how you want to live it. Not I'm going to use the government to try to make you live like a conservative. That's not conservatism to me. Well, and I'll take it a step further. Watching the technical corrections bill on the tax credit, the 350 or whatever it ended right. up being. And the only people against it were Republicans from the Senate. The bill was seconded by Carla Rose Hansen. It, John L. Bakke, the Democrat senator from Grand Forks, spoke in favor of it. I was like, what, what is going on here? What is up? What is down? And the, the GOP senators were the ones talking against the idea of giving, tax, giving the money back to the people. What is going on? I don't understand anything. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, and. You know, generally, I, I think I think it is a conservative. I mean, you can articulate a principled conservative position that we prefer permanent rate sure. cuts as opposed to one time doling things out. I think there's an argument to be made that we're having a lot of um, issues with inflation, where the amount of money that the government has poured in. I think there's arguments there that you can articulate that are perfectly sane, perfectly normal. That all that being said, I, I we had this money in North Dakota. It's been a rough time. I supported what Governor Burgum proposed with it. I didn't really understand some of the hostility that came out against it immediately, other than it's just more of the the legislature and our governor don't really like each other uh, that much. But I, I don't know. I mean, we are. We're living in very topsy-turvy times. I mean, I'm getting all these emails from from left left of center people these days are like, oh, I love your columns now. You're you've changed so much, and I'm like, you know, these things are cyclical. Just wait, we're gonna get back into some areas where you don't like me so much anymore. But I'm glad well, you're was, appreciating it for now. Yeah, I was thinking as you were saying how much you hate communism, socialism. You might be protesting too much, Rob. I mean, I think there might be something there. What do you I, mean? may, I may be joining <laughs> joining the rank the ranks of the Trumpers and thinking that deep down. Uh, deep down I really have some some secret <laughs> affinity. I've got I've got Mal's little red book here somewhere on my desk. That's what you're thinking? <laughs> you're left of Oban, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> oh man. I am not I am not, trust me. I uh my my philosophy is that I want people who think like me to take over the government and then leave everybody alone. That's that's really what I what I want. Um well, you really don't have a place in this state these days, do you? I don't, man. I just I just want people to do what they're going to do. Live the life that you want to live. I, I mean, that being said, I'm not an anarchist, right? right? I understand. I want public schools. I want police forces and fire departments, and I want the roads plowed. And I, you know, I, I think I think we have a role in, in reg. I mean, but it's just, I don't need the government to impose my culture on other people. And I think left and right, that's what a lot of people want. We want to impose a like I think a lot of people who promote a, like we were just talking about electric cars at the beginning of the show I think a lot of people who promote electric cars really want to push electric cars on maybe people they don't make a lot of sense for um like there's I mean there's 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 a push I mean you're hearing like the governor of California talking about how we're going to get rid of gas gasoline cars there's people in North Dakota saying that is nuts that is crazy yeah, I live yeah. 50 miles from the nearest city, and you're going to make me drive an electric car at, at times when it's 30 below? That makes no sense. But don't we like the idea that California can do whatever they want with electric cars and it's not going to affect us? Here a, except when California tries to use its 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 population and economic might to impose that on other states. Like some of this, that's where I have a problem. So let, let, that brings up something else that from the special session, okay. this idea of us being on an island. I don't know if you followed the QR code debate. I did. Uh, yes, where the Department of Health was going to put our vaccination status on a QR code. So when we travel to far off places like Minnesota, we can just far off. You know, yep. do the across whole, yeah, the river the to the People's yeah, Republic the of Minnesota. <laughs> and you would think that the health department was like mandating vaxes to everybody who's people leave North Dakota and we have to accept the fact that that QR code would have made a lot of people's lives easier when they're 
traveling outside of North Dakota. Well, look so at look at all the fights we've had about the Canadian border, right? I mean, that's it's yeah. it's hugely all the people who live across the border. It's hugely consequential, not just for North Dakota, but our the provinces just to the the north of us. It's a big deal being able to get back and forth across that border. So if we need to do things as the state of North Dakota to facilitate things with our Canadian friends or our Minnesota friends or our South Dakota friends or whoever, I, I, I say we do them. If you don't want to get vaccinated, I mean, that's fine. But the world doesn't have to just accept. I, yeah. I, or if, I mean, you don't, gets, oh, if you don't want to have the QR code on your phone, don't do it then. Right. Some of us do. There's not a boogeyman behind, around every corner of everything that's being done uh, in this state. I mean, that that whole debate was just off the rails, even for an off the rails section. But again, it, it fits right in and to my 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 unifying theory about everything that's wrong with politics in America is that everybody has an audience now. You know, the politicians have an audience. It's like the C-SPAN. Remember the C-SPAN effect for Congress when sure. they brought the cameras in and all of a sudden the speeches got longer and the, the rhetoric got more vicious because everybody was watching all of a sudden? It's the C-SPAN effect for our entire society because everybody who's got a Facebook account and is engaged on politics feels like they got to have a hot take on every little thing. I, I got to have a position on this. Maybe you don't. Maybe you can just not care. There's things I don't care about. Well, and the other thing on this QR thing, they, they pushed it so fast that at one point, the bill said the, the health department could not maintain any records for any vaccinations. They fixed that, thank goodness. But again, we're rushing through things that stuff like that happens when you rush through things. So uh, here's here. I, we ended the show last week by me saying, God willing, the legislature will no longer be in session. Uh, so I'm going to focus on that because I don't think they did. They got out. They got out by Friday afternoon. Good on them. Uh, Which was super impressive. I mean, to do all that they did in five days. And if they didn't do this outside uh, of redistricting and they could have been done by Wednesday. Well, absolutely. Thursday. Yeah. So anyway, well, Chad, as always, nice to talk with you. We'll uh, have you back on again Wednesday until then.